They're they're now doing. Oh, like they're now. I met with some. Some change. So I I modified that where they have to submit the four article this week. That's it. That's it. Because I've noticed. Yeah. 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 There's an original research article. Get them on biological anthropology. Those are the things. One of them is always not there. And so I've, I've scaffolded. I'm not having that issue. I'm getting a lot of emails. They're finding the right articles because I got that. Yeah. Last year, where I gave them like so the article I used, here's my example of how I wrote it up. So they know all of that. That part's easy. All the problem is, we're achievers and they're finding these things that would have like the Sonic the Hedgehog gene, HP58359, super complex human genetics. And I'm like, hey, okay, I don't want to read that article. Why are you reading it? I'm like, tote bag gang. Big thing. Uh, I think we got two very different groups of students. But my other issue was that's why now they go to the summary and it's almost entirely. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started since it's 1130. Thank you again, everybody, for coming to the Anthropology Pro Seminar Series, especially since we're in like week seven now. So it's all the more impressive. Um, so today we have a special, uh, one of the great things that's nice about our series like this is that, yeah, we can also invite people from outside of our scholarly community, finding out what about different pockets of the humanities and the social sciences, but it's also a great opportunity to find out what folks are actually doing here at UNLV, and today is no exception because we're joined by Christina Freiberger, who is an anthropology PhD candidate in the Department of Anthropology here at UNLV. So just a little bit about Christina, although I'm sure everybody already knows, but to do the proper introduction that is needed. So Christina holds an MA in anthropology from Tulane University, as well as a bachelor's of science in both public health and tropical medicine and anthropology from the same institution. Institution, leveraging bioarchaeological data as well as archival research and extant ethnographies. Her dissertation research, which we'll probably hear a little bit more about today, focuses on the highly fragmented remains from the ancestral Puebloan region of the U.S. Southwest. Her archaeological field experience is extensive. She's participated in and or supervised excavations in New Mexico and Peru. This is in addition to her ongoing work with the Zappé Osteology Lab. Is it Zappé? Zappé. Zappé yes. Osteology Lab, where she facilitated the cataloging, sorting, and analyzing of ancestral remains from Durango, Mexico. She currently manages the Southwestern Archaeological Research Lab and serves as an intern for the Nevada State Historic Preservation Office. And given that this talk is also coinciding with Indigenous Peoples Day, we'd probably be remiss if we didn't note her uh, participation in efforts to repatriate remains of Native Americans at the Lost City Museum here in Nevada. And if that were not all enough, she has multiple publications in the works. This includes a co-author chapter with our own Dr. Deborah Martin titled Pueblo Warriors, which is in cannibals, indigenous concepts of corporeality and the bioarchaeological record. The volume from the individual bodies to bodies of social theory will appear on the University of Florida Press. So be on the lookout when you get those emails from different types of presses. Don't just delete them right away. <laughs> That's what I know. <laughs> Even if you don't remember how you ended up on those listers. So with all of that said, please join me in welcoming our speaker for today, Christina Fred. Um, hi guys. So today I am going to be talking about interpreting burned and commingled ancestral remains as a complex mortuary practice. Um, this is one of my uh, publications for my dissertation. So if you guys have heard me talk about this before, um, you get to hear me talk about it again. Um, so I do kind of want to start this talk out with a little acknowledgement. This presentation does include discussion on ancestors, ancestor uh, uh, remains, and the scientific research involving ancestors. There will not be any photographs of ancestor remains, though, but we will be discussing them. So to situate yourself for this talk, we're just gonna kind of do a brief cultural background. Um, so we are looking at the ancestral Puebloan region, which is up here in yellow. It's situated in the American Southwest in the Four Corners area, which involves Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, and into Utah. For the most part, the main cultivars of this area were corn, beans, and squash, although wild resources were used. Um, in general, we're going to be looking at Pueblo 1 to Pueblo 4, which we see uh, this development of villages in Pueblo 1 and moving into larger aggregated communities during the Pueblo 4 time. There are two main 
cultural influence in areas in this region, centered at Chaco Canyon from around AD 850-900 to about 1150. Um, you can see it up there, right to the west of Santa Fe, and then also Mesa Verde, which is into Colorado, and that was a very large sphere of influence during the 1050s into about the 1260s. So ancestral Pueblo and mortuary behavior varies greatly in their burial practices. Formal interments normally involve flexed or semi-flexed positions. Although it's not that uncommon to see more kind of a haphazardly placed burials or burials with multiple individuals. Many of these graves include intentional pits um, or burials under subfloors in pit houses, as well as in natural openings and maybe cave crevices. It's really important to note though that the majority of intentional burials remain semi or mostly articulated. And the reason that's incredibly important to note is for this talk, we're going to be focusing on a subset of burials from the ancestral Puebloan world, mm -hmm. described as highly fragmented remains or extreme process remains. So the high, these fragmented remains are skeletal assemblages that have been intensely culturally modified. Uh, these remains are frequently cut, burned, broken, disarticulated, and commingled. These collections are culturally modified during the time of, or before death. So this is not a taphonomic event. This is being done by people to the remains. Highly fragmented remains have been found throughout the ancestral Puebloan world, as well as they range in time periods from early Pueblo one into the historic time. So over the years, there have been a number of different interpretations for these highly fragmented remains. Um, these motivations include massacre events, destruction of enemies, corpse manipulation, ontological and security events, witch executions, social control, and cannibalism. My research is suggesting a complex mortuary practice um, which involves ritualistic corpse manipulation and burning of the remains for protection from perceived malevolent forces as a way to separate them from the living communities. So as mentioned, one of the more common and very widespread theory about these highly fragmented remains, the concept that they were created as a result of cannibalism. Um, one of the more critical pieces of literature is Turner's Mancorn book, as well as Tim White's uh, Mancus book. So both of these books argue that the remains resemble faunal remains from the region and thus must have been consumed. Turner in his book creates this cursory checklist of six criteria that basically make it so that these remains resemble faunal collections and are classified as cannibalism. These checklists include breakage, cut marks, burning, anvil abrasion, pop polishing, and missing vertebrae. However, there are other possible explanations for these criteria. For example, vertebrae frequently are destroyed or missing in biological excavations regard this, as well as Turner never fully describes what classifies as missing vertebrae as his data includes discussions of cut marks on vertebrae. So there are vertebrae present. And in addition, pop polish for the most part nowadays has been disregarded as a more taponomic event than a cultural practice. For this talk today, we are going to be mainly focusing on burning as a concept and as a cultural modification to these remains. So as mentioned, there are some flaws with cannibalism claim. Many of the past studies do not include cultural context. They simply review the remains without placing them within their cultural setting. They didn't offer a satisfying reason to explain the cannibalism as well. As stated before, past studies ignored complicated relations between victims and the individuals who handled their bodies after death. 
Why modify the remains to this extent? These highly fragmented collections include up to thousands of fragments of bones. For example, the collection from Sacred Ridge in Colorado was made up of 12,000 bone fragments. In addition, violence against corpse communicates a symbolic and socially meaningful message to the living. These highly fragmented remains involve lots of cultural modification, and there has to be a specific reason for this modification. Again, um, I'm arguing these highly fragmented remains are most likely have a much deeper cultural meaning than just simple cannibalism. So for this project in particular, uh, I'm suggesting a complex mortuary practice as an alternative hypothesis for these burned, highly fragmented remains. I used a number of lines of evidence for this, including osteological data from past researchers, archeological data from past researchers, and ethnographic history. Most of the sites and collections I will be talking about today have been repatriated um, or are no longer available for researchers to um, examine in person. So when thinking about highly fragmented remains, just as a basic overview, when we look at the demography of them, so what are they, who are they made out of? Um, most of these collections are made or involve multiple individuals. Uh, the number of individuals in these collections vary from as small as a single individual to as large as more than 30. Um, collections for the most part range from about three to 10, but it's not uncommon to see a minimal number of individuals higher in the 30s region. For the most part, the demography frequently resembles a family unit. So this means the collections include the remains from men, women, as well as children, and individuals of all ages ranging from adults to infants. There is clear evidence of corpse manipulation in these highly fragmented remains. Uh, these remains though do not involve embedded points, which may have suggested warfare, but they do show cut marks and some of them even show perimortem head trauma as well as other skeletal traumas, which may indicate a violent death. The majority of cut marks are around muscle attachment sites or areas that you would need to cut through for disarticulation. And there are also a number of cut marks placed in particular areas to maybe indicate trophy taking. So this would involve areas around the lip, the nose, uh, tongue, or the scalp. This is an example from Sacred Ridge. So you can see the cut marks in bright red across the forehead of these individuals. That would maybe indicate scalp taking. So again, for this talk, the aspect of burning is closely looked at. Burning of bone might have a culturally specific reason and not just simply for consumption. Burning was included in the criteria for cannibalism because it resembled the faunal remains from the ancestral Pueblo and region that were burned during the cooking process. However, no examples of cannibalism are seen in the ethnographic record from the Southwest, and yet this theory prevails much to the annoyance and frustration of descendant communities. Highly fragmented remains do not line up with periods of resource scarcity and are therefore not examples of starvation cannibalism. Um, and the motivation for the cannibalism often offered by past researchers involves simple things like Toltec thugs coming up from Mesoamerica to influence the Southwest, or kind of this broad idea of a social pathology that is spreading within the region. So for my research, I did a literature review of sites that were identified to have highly fragmented remains in them. So I looked at 86 sites that were identified to have highly fragmented remains. 19 of those sites were excluded. Um, 16 because the MNI was one, which often offered very little information about the skeletal remains or the site itself where the remains were found. There are also a few sites that were listed as having highly fragmented remains, but did not offer 
the minimal number of individuals at the site. Three were excluded because I considered them outside the cultural group of the ancestral Southwest. This included um, Casas Grande from Mexico, which some researchers will put in the ancestral region, but for my research, I excluded it. Um, so this left us with 67 sites within the cultural group with an MNI of two or larger that had highly fragmented remains. The help of someone in our department, I um, plotted these sites using GIS onto a map of the region. So again, this is the Four Corners region of the United States. And this is showing the 67 sites plotted across the landscape. You can kind of see a cluster of sites here, which is Chaco Canyon, as well as a number of sites up there in the Mesa Verde region. So researchers have labeled these highly fragmented sites as cannibalism, violence, and or cannibalism or violence. So by looking at, we have 40 sites that are listed as cannibalism, this is about 60%, that's the dark red. 18 sites are listed as violence, and then nine sites are listed as violence and or cannibalism, meaning either the researchers could not make up their own minds or there were multiple researchers that argued about a single site. So when we're looking for this talk today at burning remains within those sites, unfortunately, since this is a lit review, um, I had to use past researchers data on these sites. So we had 43 sites that had information and stated the remains were burnt. 18 sites had no information about the remains being burnt and six sites had no burnt remains. So it's very obvious that very few did not have this burning. So this is again, the same map of the original 67 sites with highly fragmented remains, but only showing the 43 that had burned remains at them. Um, and so besides, again, this cluster around culturally important areas like Mesa Verde, they are spread still across the landscape. They're not focused in one area. If we look at time periods, they're again not focused in one time period. The majority of sites are found in the Pueblo in two and the Pueblo in three area, but we still see sites from Pueblo one as well as in two historic times in Pueblo four. This also is showing that these collections are not correlating with only times of high resource stress as we see them over hundreds of years period. So if we're just looking at the remains with burnt or the sites with burned remains, kind of changes our percentage of what the claims are. So 31 of these sites are listed as cannibalism Five were listed as violence and seven were listed as violence and or cannibalism. Um, so it's kind of interesting to note that if you were to combine these, the violence and or cannibalism with the cannibalism, you get a total of 88% of these sites being claimed as cannibalism sites um, and the ones with the burnt remains. I also looked at the MNI, so the minimal number of individuals involved in these sites. So um, again, we see this range from smaller collections, so two to six individuals, up into this much larger 21 to 40 individuals seen in these collections. Um, this kind of suggests this variety that's happening within these highly fragmented remains. Um, and I wanted to see if the remains being burned had any effect on the MNI. And finally, I looked at the collections that gave me information about the total percentage of burns within the collect or bones within the collection that were burned. So researchers argued, again, yeah, the burnt faunal remains in the Southwest resembled the highly fragmented human remains, and thus they were being 
processed the same way. So in the Southwest, the range for faunal remains are burnt between about 2.6% to 79.4%, which is a pretty large range in my opinion. Um, but still we see collections that fall outside of that range, although we do see collections that fall in that range as well. But again, I am arguing that the burning is not for consumption, it's for something else. And so the base of this argument for me is that according to a lot of past researchers, these collections were only burned for consumption. They disregarded any cultural meaning behind the burning. But we need to remember that in the Puebloan world, fire and ash have a lot of importance. Fire can be used as a ritualistic transformation. Uh, as well, ash and fire are used in the Puebloan world to alter or close spaces. Today and in historic times, they are frequently used to close kivas, as well as being linked to purification practices um, and are used to stop harmful energy. Burnt human remains thus might have resulted from a complex social event and mortuary ritual and not simply from consumption. So this kind of gets into the uh, Amicity of Ash and the Southwest. So a lot of indigenous groups perceive objects of having animate power um, that are similar to a person. They contain a type of powerful magic that interacts with the world. Objects like ash can take an agency of their own and can affect people around them. Fire can work to both physically transform items as well as make them less powerful for this magic. Ash can serve as protection as a way to ward off dangerous and malevolent forces. And ash can also be used to disinfect or purify areas that may have been considered charmed or to have evil influences over them. So a great example of this in the Puebloan world is closing events. Ancestral Puebloan groups frequently moved across their landscape and often burned pit houses and kivas when they left uh, sites. Homes were intimately associated with people's lives, including the burials of ancestors within the floors. Pueblos in particular rooms could have been considered to be alive. Objects and rooms left behind could have been used by those wanting to do the living heart. And thus burning of the structure and objects resulted in them being sealed and protected from those who might want to harm the formal inhabitants. Closing rituals, particularly those that involve fire, can also enhance remembrance and establish memory-laden events for these communities. The act of burning and the ash left behind would separate the living from the past inhabitants of that site, so i.e. the dead. Ash and burning would also purify these places if they were considered to be tainted by malevolent spirits. So witches in the Southwest are an example of these malevolent spirits. Ancestral Puebloan people viewed witchcraft as a constant threat to their existence. Um, to protect the communities from these malevolent entities, Puebloans often believe ritualistic acts of purification, including the use of ash were used. Witches were thought to bring evil to whole communities so they could bring sickness or drought or floods. They could harm crops or even people. As well, witchcraft was considered an inherited trait. So men, women, and children could be witches. So more or less it ran in family. Witch executions were said um, to maybe be what was causing these highly fragmented remains. So witches during executions were pounded, defleshed, burned um, to make sure that they were not returned to the living. Again, this is similar to what we're seeing in highly fragmented remains collections. Puebloan ethnography says that the first person climbed out of the Seipu from the world below and a witch came out with them. Um, 
pit houses and kivas are considered spaces between the world of the living and the dead. So some researchers, for example, Walker in his 2022 article suggests that placing remains in these spaces may have shown the ancients wanting to push witches back down into the world where they belonged. There's also multiple ethnographic oral history involving witch killings, um, or even entire villages that were killed because they were believed to have fallen away from the ideal version of um, Hopi life or have become malevolent forces. So in the ethnographic history, there are a few Hopi stories of towns that were destroyed by fire as a way to purify them because it was felt as if they were no longer human. They had become witches because of wrongdoings. Um, so wrongdoers being influenced by these malevolent forces were often just totally eliminated. An ethnographic example of this is the town of Pian von Hogkongi. Um, what happened there was said to be a gambling craze that threw the whole village into social chaos. People soon became addicted and neglected all their responsibilities. Concerned for his people, the village chief asked for help from a group of spirits to set fire to the village and rid evil from his people. The spirits agreed and with the help of another neighboring village set fire and killed everyone who was inside. So this is an example of fire being used to rid people uh, because they were no longer believed to be good. This also plays into the Hopi idea of Kweon Sapi. Um, and it's kind of this thought of life being out of balance or having a corrupt life. So generally when this concept engulfs an entire village, the community is considered past the point of no return. And a new beginning can only be established through a total eradication of the evil. Um, so this kind of ties into this idea that if something is going on, it is socially acceptable to basically eradicate an entire group of people. And it also ties into the social theory of ontological insecurity. So ontological insecurity can serve as a great framework for the theory of how we want to view these highly fragmented remains. Ontological insecurity, uh, well, sorry, ontological security will prevail as long as a group identity is stable and cohesive. Anything that threatens the core idea of the group can be seen as an ontological threat. Group identity is really this glue that brings communities together. Um, and when social routines are undermined and threatened, the core identity of the group and the adhesion to routine can be at risk. Threats can be real or imaginary, as well, it doesn't matter as long as they're perceived by the population as a threat. Um, the perception of outside threats to a collective group can be just as fear provoking as an actual threat and can cause people to react just as strongly in response. The idea of witches or some other malevolent agent causing your life to fall out of balance may have been the driving force behind the creation of these highly fragmented remains. So thus I want you guys to consider the following. Were the individuals whose remains are found in these highly uh, fragmented collections considered witches? Uh, we know that witches were cut, defleshed, and burned, and we see this in these highly fragmented collections. It's been suggested that constant stress of living in a harsh drought-prone environment could have left communities to be stressed and to have frequent witch accusations. Environmental stress is not the only cause that might have uh, led to witch accusations. Social strife and even interpersonal problems could have led to it. So could these highly fragmented remains be the result of witch executions? In addition, we also need to remember that corpses have social power over the living. Witches in the Southwest um, were commonly associated with necromancy and were considered to be just as dangerous alive as they were dead. 
Um, although they were no longer physically alive, corpses could have had a direct social influence on those around them. And this could have handled how they were dealt with in death. Um, so was the burning of these remains a way to keep them from further harming the living? Uh, Ash can act as this agent of purification. It stands the reason that burning the remains of individuals considered malevolent uh, would have caused them to lose their power and their influence on the living. And then could burning the remains be a culturally specific act that was done to separate the dead from the living? As mentioned, closing acts are meant to invoke this remembrance. Burning these remains could create a lasting memory in the remaining community members. And finally, is it possible that these highly fragmented remains were burned in order to protect the living from the dead? Uh, was the act of burning away from past communities to feel as if they were protecting themselves from evildoers and harm? And thus was an important ritualistic act um, involved in maybe witch executions and not simply the result of cooking. So as researchers, we must consider the significant uh, concepts about acts like corpse manipulations uh, can be, should be viewed within social contexts. Uh, at their most simple, these highly fragmented remains are a form of corpse manipulation. They cannot nor should be separated from their social contacts. These acts are not done in isolation. Corpse manipulation is socially motivated and performative. It takes a lot of work to modify these remains as intensely as seen in the highly fragmented collections from the Southwest. This must have been done for a reason. It's key to note that the way the dead are handled conveys a meaning to the living. Looking only at the remains and disregarding culture will often give you an incomplete narrative of what was happening. Acts like burning could have had particular importance and meaning. Uh, and we must look at them within their cultural context. So I really want to hammer home this idea that context and social meaning should not be separated from mortuary acts like corpse manipulations. Or highly fragmented remains should not automatically be assumed to be the result of cannibalism, but perhaps this complex mortuary practice with a deep cultural meaning. These collections need to be continued to be investigated and to better understand the cultural connection behind their creation. I hope further bioarch researchers uh, continue to blend this cultural meaning and social theory with our excavations of skeletal collections in the future. Thank you guys so much for your time. Happy to take questions. Yes. Um, I have two questions actually. Okay. So in the beginning, you showed us some maps and some distributions, and you had explained that there's a range of MNI from these very small collections of twos mm -hmm. to upwards of 20 something. Yes. Is there a pattern in the temporality of those? So where, is there a pattern no. in the time period where the smaller collections are early and they get larger over time? That would be lovely if that was the case. Um, actually, unfortunately, one of the larger uh, sites here is a site up here, which is Sacred Bridge. And it is a very early site. It dates to about 800 AD, so Pueblo one, And it has an MNI of 30. So it's one of the larger ones we see. So then we can progress all the way into um, Pueblo 4, where we see the site of Palaka Wash, and it also has an MNI of, of 30. So there doesn't seem to be that they started off small and then progressively got bigger and bigger. Um, it does kind of go across the board and across time periods for everything. Um, we do see, it does appear as if the larger sites have a more clear demography to them, where we very clearly see that they are made up of men, women, and children. Um, and although we can't do any DNA testing in this region, there's been a dental uh, characteristic comparisons 
for some of these sites, that does suggest that maybe the individuals within the collections are more closely related than other individuals in the uh, population. So it doesn't neatly map on. I've heard it doesn't. I would love it if it did. Yeah. Tensions over time and lack of, of farmland or whatever. And, and so that practice increases. So it doesn't really play out. The other question was, because I've excavated very complicated burnt um, context. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they were also highly ritualistic. Any other objects or things with the human remains? No, and actually that's one of the interesting parts of these highly fragmented remains. They seem to be lacking in cultural uh, like material. There are not beads with them. There's not personal adornments. Um, for the most part, many of them are found on the floor of pit houses or kivas simply fragmented and nothing else. Um, sometimes there's a matate in there, but even for the most part, it appears as if uh, pottery is missing. So um, they were not placed with anything, which is kind of interesting as well. Um, right, because I know for the Maya, that's basically yeah. stripping them of their personhood. Yeah, exactly. That, that's been an argument actually for the witch execution is you would want to remove everything from the when you were trying to separate them from their world because it would take away from this concept of them still having power. Um, a few of them were seen, there's one site that's actually seen where the remains are intermixed with the remains of uh, dogs, which is kind of interesting, um, who are also highly fragmented. Uh, so I'm not sure what that would. Dogs also be witches? Yes, they could. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if I jumped out. <laughs> Uh, someone else had another question. Yeah. I have two also. Okay. And, uh, as you know, we've studied a lot of ash. Yes, your ash. book is a lot of what kind of was put into this. But in the Mimbros area, so in, I worked in southern New Mexico, in the Mimbros area, we have these closure events that are really focused on um, what we think of mm -hmm. kind of cleansing yeah. and closing but then they reoccupy right away. How, do you have an idea of the percentage of these no, sites that are reoccupied? Almost none of them. I, I only thought. know of one site that had a highly fragmented uh, remains were just basically deposited and then it appears as if everyone left. So it does almost seem like whatever is causing these highly fragmented remains to be created, it is such a large event in the community that everyone picks up their stuff and goes after it. So it's not, not the same that. kind of purification, cleansing as we see in other areas. It's really kind of closed. It, it's truly, it's we are done. done. We are done with this site and we are moving on and we are not gonna come back here. Um, despite the fact that in a lot of uh, modern day Puebloan um, ideology, these sites are not ever considered uh, abandoned. They are still considered part of the landscape and considered occupied by ancestors and the dead. Um, but living people no longer return back to live there. Uh, there may be visit for ritualistic events, but not to live. Um, and what was your other question? Was that the My second question? question is more kind of existential. Do okay. you think you would have less pushback on this? If, if they, I mean, in general, mm -hmm. I mean, because they're, you know, yeah. they're the dialects out there, yeah. as you know. If we didn't use the word witch, do you yes. think we Honestly, so I actually do, um, because that's one of the arguments by a lot of people is they say, oh, um, the Puebloan people didn't have a concept of witches until uh, the introduction of Europeans. But it's true. Maybe that is true. Um, but they very clearly had an idea of malevolent spirits, um, of malevolent forces. Even at just the basic, they had an idea of evil doers and this concept that something can cause the world to go wrong. Um, so I agree. I actually think the word witches might be very laden in its terminology. Um, and so I try actually to use malevolent forces a lot, but it's a mouthful sometimes. And um, when talking to people in America, it sometimes is easier to connect with this idea of witches. 
And ironically enough, someone pointed out that uh, Europeans did this with witches as well. We burned witches um, as again to this way to purify, to transform, kind of. Yes. I have one question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but it's probably not going to be as well articulated as the other ones. So, uh, first of all, great presentation and really appreciated kind of uh, jumping off of the farms there uh, with the way that you frame the research and that how you're moving away from complicating these sort of prior explanations that rely on cannibalism, which, as you point out very systematically, you know, the empirical basis for it is questionable. Um, and that whole like systematic review of the 67 some odd sites makes that very apparent. But it also seems like a lot of the argument hinges on the use of ethnographic literature. So it's basically a question about ethnography and, and sort of a little bit of kind of, I think maybe what Barb was into, because I, as I understand it, not being an archaeologist, like the perennial problem for archaeologists is how do you make historic and prehistoric inferences based on ethnography. So maybe if you could talk a little bit about like the ethnographic sources that you're using, the time period that they come from. I thought sure. some of the citations were yeah. more recent, but you know, you um, so a lot of them are recent. Um, but you know, when you talk about ethnography, you always have to kind of caveat this with a lot of these stories though are older stories that have been passed down. Um, we are lucky in the Southwest that a lot of the indigenous tribes that are currently there are most likely the direct descendants of the tribes that were there in the past. Um, like we see this occupation of a few pueblos that are still occupied today and were occupied when the Spanish showed up um, in the 1400s. And so, but the question about, you know, where do you draw this line between ethnographic information and um, like skeletal remains, uh, it's very hard to kind of nitpick. We have a great example, which a lot of, I didn't talk about, but there is one site um, in here that is frequently cited as kind of this great example of what's going on with um, these collections, because these two right here, uh, which are in the modern day Hopi reservation, um, they consist of the site of Awadavi and in the site of Palaco Wash. So um, this site is a site with a lot of highly fragmented remains, it's excavated, remains are broken, burned, all of that. Um, and then Awadaviv has both an ethnographic story behind it and a historic story, because it happened right at the same time as the Pueblo and Revolt. Um, so the story goes that, again, this village fell out of the way of Hopi life. They were becoming Christians is what was actually going on. Uh, and they were no longer, you know, acting like Hopis any longer. They had invited in priests into the town and a lot of individuals, including the chief saw this as them falling to malevolent forces. And so there's the story of him going around to the surrounding villages and actually asking them to come and cleanse the entire town. And as the story goes, so they killed a ton of people in the town, but then they took captives to walk back to other uh, villages. And during that walk, it was decided that the captives too had already followed the forces and couldn't be left alive. And then that is what the site of block of wash is. Um, and the reasons that's argued is because that remains were uh, carbon dated and they fit the correct time period. Um, that site is kind of slightly more biased towards individuals that appear to be uh, uh, female in their sex estimation. So that would kind of mark again with captive taking in the area. So, it's one of those, like, we have a great example. It seems like it fits, it's perfect. Um, but I do understand the hesitancy with any type of ethnographic information and any type of like theoretical framework. But I do think it's a really important resource that our like researchers should not just disregard and throw away the baby of the bathwater sort of thing. Um, especially in an area that is lucky to have such a rich history of it. Yes. Can you go back to the pot, the one that gives the time periods? So uh, this is only sites with highly fragmented remains of them. Okay. So you were sorry. Burnt. I think it's really interesting. So you have Chaco in the middle of that. Yes. This is Chaco right here. Yes. 
There's also, um, if anyone is going to count these, um, because of the zoom of this, there are actually slightly more sites here that you can't see, as well as slightly more sites up here, um, just because we're zoomed out so much. Some of these sites are less than like two miles away from each other. So do you think, I'm just asking you to speculate, because as you know, everybody has an opinion about this, but do you think that it is Chaco and influence on, on, especially on like the Galena and the yeah. Missouri? Do you think? Honestly, I'm going to say no, okay. because I think it's happening prior to Chaco influence. Um, because like a great example, again, is uh, Sacred Ridge. I keep citing it, but it's a really well uh, researched site. It was it's one of the more recent ones is the other thing. So we have a ton of information about it. Actually, our very own uh, Anna Osterholtz did research there. And so, um, and this one is so early and it looks identical to some of the um, collections from later time period. So if it is an influence from Chaco, it's not starting there. Um, that's my argument. And I actually think some of, as strange as this is to say, I actually think that one or two of the sites at Chaco should actually be removed and that the highly fragmented remains from those sites are the result of improper excavations from there in the early 1900s. So that uh, never happens. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, um, so that's there's no way that some guy came in and was like, oh goodness. Um, <laughs> for a great, a, just a, a caveat, interesting fun fact that um, one of these sites that everyone is like, it's a perfect example of the cannibalism, um, you know, the remains were scattered across the room. Uh, if you go back and read the excavation notes, it was one of the few sites that was excavated by an indigenous individual who was helping. And his notes, it very clearly states, remains placed on burial mats. It's like, oh, <laughs> that doesn't really fit with the cannibalism concept at all. Um, but that's, no one pays attention to that. So, get nice little trowel incisions on the yes cranium. exactly um, that sort of stuff um, <laughs> yeah all right wait does anyone have any other questions so, like this isn't really an in-depth question at all but what's the site up in the by bears ears up there in the, in the red this one the one at the far northwest yeah yeah oh that is cave seven which is an earlier site um and it's almost actually into the basket maker period uh, as well. Interesting. Um, and then my other question was, did you say Palaka wash or Palaka wash? Palaka. Palaka, okay. Um, I think it's yellow CC. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, all right, anyone? Oh, I got two. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, um, is there any difference between, um, I'm not very familiar with this area, with the remains, the burned remains found in Pueblo and four that are like later, more mm -hmm. close to like missionaries being around and yeah. looking to. So um, interestingly, no is the argument is they seem incredibly similar to the other ones, but they also are kind of sitting right on that cusp, if that makes any sense, that it would have been, it would have been right at the time period where either, you know, the Spanish were first starting to take over this area and influence it, um, as well as maybe before, because it, it was carbon dated in like the, uh, I think the late 80s, early 90s. It's very early. So it has a, a nice big hundred year range in it. Um, and so, it could be argued it was maybe right before, or it could be argued that it was right after. A lot of people suggest that it was during the time period of um, the Puebloan revolt. So when a lot of the Puebloan tribes actually did push back against the Spanish in that area, um, and they fought kind of a, a revolt, you know, and it might have been right around that time frame as well. So there probably would have been a lot of maybe stress within communities regardless. 
in terms of a uh, number of individuals for those two sides mm -hmm. like what, what what are those like uh, okay so this one is about um i think it's it's 30 it's into the 30s high 20s um and then this that one the exact m and i is kind of an argued point um because it was excavated and examined again in like, I think the 1920s. And the researcher is like, it was the whole village. Um, but then of course, when someone went and looked in the nineties at it, it was eight individuals. So um, that's a bit of a, a bit of a change between that. But yeah, that's the, that's a Wadaviv, which is the site of the whole story and everything. And then that one's block a wash. Um, so the story is the whole village was destroyed, um, but the American Museum of Natural History only has eight remains from there. So, um, and then Jenny, can you go to your monkey line? Excuse me, your monkey line, your image of your the the cut marks. Oh yes, yes. This is from Sacred Ridge. Um, so this is showing all of the cut marks um, mapped onto one single body. Um, so this is multiple individuals, different cut marks from multiple different individuals mapped onto a single body from Sacred Ridge. So is that all ages? Yes, this would have been all ages mapped onto a single adult body. And you didn't see any indication that infants or children would have been marked differently than adults? No, they actually, it appears as if they were handled the exact same way, which is interesting. Yes. Um, this was this image is actually generated from uh, Anna Osterholtz. It's from her research from that site that I've used. Um, but yeah, it's she did intensive comparisons between Sacred Ridge and another site of Mancus. Um, and she found that it appears that for the most part, they were handled very similarly. I think some of her, uh, you know, comparisons was Mancus was slightly like tended to break the bone more than cut it. But besides that, individuals were still disarticulated. Um, and I think Mancus has more children in it than Sacred Ridge does, but they again appear to have been handled almost the exact same way. They were placed with the adult burials um, and disarticulated and burned. Yeah, just so once. there's no age or sex differences. They're all treated the same. They all seem to be treated the same. Yeah. Yes. I recall, because I remember Anna talking about this when I was a master's or, you know, getting my master's and PhD here. Didn't she say they even like the turkeys? It was like everything. It was full the dogs. They the the dogs. dogs. Okay. Okay, I was gonna say, I remember she was like, this was scorched earth was how she described it. Yeah, um, so that one's interesting uh, because they they found them in two different structures from the sites, um, but they found remains that fit back together from these yes. two separate structures. So uh, they were processed and then truly spread across the site. Um, Sacred Ridge also has a few, they did chemical analysis of a few pots there that came back as having human blood in them. Some researchers say that supports the cannibalism concept. I say if you're going to be spreading human remains around a site, it kind of makes sense to put them in a pot. Um, but uh, that can be kind of taken. Does the residue way. differentiate between human and just lipids, like just regular blood? blood? animal blood are we at that point they say it, it is and you can differentiate yeah, the purpose there's, there's, there's a approach that's a forensic method too that you can do yeah. yeah i was like yes there's uh all right because every obsidian blade in the maya area is used for for sacrifice so yeah, yeah obviously <laughs> not like any of those things are sharp you know you can never nick yourself on an obsidian blade um yeah there's um I guess if no one has any questions, if you want to hear me rant, one of these sites has a copper light from it that was tested uh, and it was said to have human myoglobin in it. So uh, tissue, and it's been a very key piece in the argument that these were cannibalism remains. Um, but the copper light itself, 
was never really proven to be human. It was designated human by the fact that it was the correct size. <laughs> um, as well as for me, the most interesting thing about it is apparently there was nothing in the copper light besides the human mount of hemoglobin. So no hair, no plant material, no plant proteins, no pollen, which I find really suspicious um, because as a, Carl Reinhardt says he's looked at thousands of ancestral copper lights and he's never seen one that looked like that. Um, and then unfortunately, uh, during the process of extracting, if there is human or myoglobin in it, they destroyed the whole copper light. So it was one and done and uh, we will never know. But um, I don't know, I, I take that with a grain of salt because of just the oddity of the copper light itself. Yes, I actually have a question about that because that's really fascinating. So <clears throat> could it have been like a false positive that like, since we're not sure like if it was an animal, like let's say like animals have a tendency to like lick their wounds, like could it have been their own blood that was consumed? Okay, so um, so it was the copper light was tested and it came back positive for human um, organ proteins actually. So a uh, carnivore could have. Yes, yeah, so it could have been it could have been a carnivore, but it was still human. The human was eaten. It wasn't like a bobcat licking its own wound. Right. Okay, it so it was organ. It was a human blood. organ that was found within the copper light. Um, I. I mean, I am unsure because my expertise is not on copper lights, but I actually almost wonder if it was just human organ meat that has been processed in such a way that it maybe resembled a copper light. Because you have to think this was what, like multiple hundred years after this point. And the fact that there was no other food sources in it for a human, that would mean that they were eating nothing but human flesh for three days. And that seems really unusual. So um, uh, that's kind of why I take it with a grain of salt. So I'm glad we have these talks right at lunchtime. Uh, <laughs> I haven't done that now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess I'll say thank you guys for coming to my talk. Yeah. <laughs>